Well, we will go ahead and get started. Um, we are had uh, 31 attendees that signed up for the presentation, and hopefully they'll join us uh, pretty soon. If not, I'm very happy to have all of you here and speak with you today. And uh, I, I'd love to, especially now that we have representation from other countries, uh, I'd love to hear um, feedback from you as we um, go through the presentation today on what you're experiencing in your countries as well. Um, today, I'd like to talk with you about the nonprofit technology in a post-COVID world that we're experiencing here. Um, and uh, this is a global issue, not just a local issue. So again, I'm glad to have all of you here and representing your areas. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am the Vice President of Information Technology at a local nonprofit organization in North Carolina. Um, I work for the Partnership for Children of Cumberland County. We are early childhood focused, uh, but I serve uh, other vendors and organizations throughout our state with IT concerns, any IT managed services, um, any software, hardware, or networking issues that they have, um, our team helps them with that. Um, I'm also an event producer at NC Tech for Good. Judy Hallman, who is also in attendance, is another one of our event producers. And then we have Jean Allen. Um, she is not with us today, but hopefully you'll get to meet her one day soon as well. I'm also the Nickel Jesus member and presenter uh, for that group as well. That is the North Carolina Local Government Information Systems Association. So I'm happy to talk with you about the local government side as well um, as the public sector. In my private life, I am a mother and wife. I'm an avid but beginning hiker and also a plant-based foodie. So I'm happy to talk about any of those things with you offline as well. There it is. Okay, um, if you have trouble hearing me, if I'm not speaking loud enough, or if I'm speaking too softly, or if I'm speaking too quickly, please let me know and I'm happy to change my pace. All right, and now I want to know about all of you. What are the hats that you wear? Um, what is your name? What is your role in NP Tech? And what are your current passions? And I'll get started with Judy. Judy, would you like to share a little bit about yourself? All right, uh, a little sub here. Um, I'm Judy Holman. I retired from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 1999. I was campus webmaster and IT support at the time. Thank you, Judy. Anything that you're passionate about right now that you'd like to share with the group? Zoom. Zoom, I want yes. To see Zoom go away. People out here want to do face-to-face -face meetings. I like Zoom. So do I. And I think it's going to be around for a very long time. And we'll talk about that today. Thank you. Thank you. Adi, would you like to share some information about yourself with our group? We may have lost her. Yeah, sorry. No, no. Oh, there no, you are. It's her. <laughs> so, uh, uh, okay, uh, my name is Adi Shahar, and uh, I'm a founder and chief enthusiastic officer of a nonprofit organization called Heartbeat Clowns. Um, we, um, my passion is therapeutic clowning, and that is what we, our organization is all about. We upskill um, youth in the professional skill of therapeutic clowning and take the, our services to various health care facilities in currently only in Johannesburg, but we're hoping to expand. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing today. Ivan? Uh, hello. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, my name is uh, Ivan Siralta. I work out of Calgary in uh, Alberta. And um, and uh, I am uh, a biologist by training, and uh, I follow my passion early after uh, doing my doctorate. Uh, and I, I've been working in nonprofits for 
since 2000. I'm currently unemployed, but I'm really keen on, uh, on connecting with uh, nonprofit technologies from other places. Um, and I tend to speak a little, <clears throat> a little bit too long. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the most important thing. I, I think I concur, if I heard Judy correctly, uh, I think that uh, I, I am very keen on understanding how this pandemic uh, created uh, a quant and, st and step uh, up from all the nonprofits that, uh, I, I don't know if you recall circa 2019, but we were all really concerned every time we were gonna have a voice call, uh, everybody or a, or a PowerPoint presentation, everybody thought, oh my God, technology is gonna fail us and we're gonna embarrass ourselves. And here we are today, uh, 20 months later, we're connecting with people from all over the world. Uh, and my, my biggest passion is in inclusion. And, and I've seen that now more and more organizations use uh, free functions from things like Teams, uh, from, uh, from Zoom to create closed captioning for people that uh, are hearing impaired. So I think, I think there, is, there are some, some small silver linings in all the situation that we have to undergo now. And I hope, Rebecca, that you pass to the North Carolina TechSoup people that uh, if, if we can meet face to face, we should still always have the option to meet uh, uh, remotely because that creates ties, right? Absolutely. Uh, I, think, I think technology, instead of being seen as an impediment, is now uh, we have shifted our thinking and, and thinking about it as a bridge. So mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, please continue on and uh, pleasure to meet all of you. Same to you. Thank you, Ivan. I couldn't say it better. You, you said it all. I love it. Um, Skylar, would you like to share some information about yourself as well? Hi, um, my name is Skylar, obviously. Um, I am an accounting clerk with a, a legal aid firm in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I recently joined back in March, uh, coming from um, the private sector. Um, and I, uh, as well as being an accounting clerk, I also do like some backup tech work. Um, we do have a director of technology, but we are a small organization. So I help out wherever is needed. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Skylar. Uh, Jesse Bradley, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself as well? What are your hats? Did we lose you? I think oh, Jesse is on the chat. I don't think he has access to a microphone. Oh, I see. Okay, yes. Jesse has shared with us. He is the program director. He's a program director and founder, and his passions are digital skills training, and his mic is not working yet. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for letting me know. Um, and Jesse, it is nice to have you here. Thank you so much. And please keep communicating with us in the chat. I appreciate that. Um, Chris Tuttle, I know you very well. I follow you on Twitter, a great Twitter page. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself with us today? Thank you. That's sweet. Um, hey, I'm Chris. Uh, Judy, good to see you again. Uh, good to see you as well, Rebecca. And um, I am a digital strategist. I work with nonprofits to uh, help them use digital more effectively, from web to email to social, text messaging, chat, AI. And of course, nowadays, a lot of virtual events and live broadcasts. Um, I definitely don't see it going away uh, anytime soon. And I think like Ivan and others have said, uh, the last year and a half have, has really accelerated a move that was already happening and really forced a lot of nonprofits to deal with using uh, digital to reach people when we couldn't in person. And so my passion is actually uh, keeping that going so we don't return to a in-person only world. I think there's a lot of opportunity for hybrid and virtual in the future. I'm excited to hear y'all talk more about it today. So thanks for letting me join you. Absolutely, thank you, Chris, thank you. Um, Ashwin, uh, would you mind sharing with us who you are and, and what your passions are? Yeah, uh, so I founded a nonprofit called as Asha Hope Amanaki. So I, along with a friend of mine who's from the Hawaiian Islands, we kind of formed this nonprofit to do um, certain activities, certain good activities in our community, which is in Portland, Oregon. 
and while doing these activities we kind of also like to promote our cultural backgrounds me being from india i kind of have uh, try to promote uh, indian culture in the region and she being from the tongan islands she likes to promote her culture so that's what we're trying to do so yeah that's about me Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your information. Uh, and it's so nice to meet all of you today. And hopefully we'll share some information that will help and uh, get some resources and advice from one another today. What do we all have in common? We've talked about where we're from, what our passions are, and, and they're similar, but they're all varying. And we're from different areas of the world. Uh, but what we all share is that we're all dedicated tech, technology enthusiasts who care about our nonprofit mission or cause in the community that it serves. So, so we all have one thing in common today, and it's great to meet with each one of you today. So another question that I have for you, and feel free to put this in chat, uh, what is your current work arrangement and how has that been impacted by the pandemic? Are you working fully within the brick and mortar walls of your office? Are you working in a hybrid or staggered schedule where you're in the office, but you're practicing some personal safety with other coworkers? Or are you working from home exclusively, either by choice or because your organization is still shut down because of the pandemic? Um, and go ahead and, and enter your answers in the chat window. We've got Ashwin reporting that everyone is remote. Ivan from home. Chris, we were remote before COVID and still are. We're also doing hybrid events, which require occasional travel and in-person work, yes. Back in the office for four days a week. Had several people test positive for COVID and now we're back home again. Scholar, that is absolutely a reality of where we are right now. Uh, we think we're back on track and everyone's healthy. We get back into the office working a hybrid or staggered schedule and then someone is exposed and we have to roll back. Yes. ID, remote from home. Yes, work from home. But we'll be brick and mortar beginning in October um, as far as Jesse. Yes. So, so we have... Um, Individuals across the board, uh, several of you reported that you're working fully remote, um, a few saying that they have a hybrid schedule, which is typical. I'm also on a hybrid schedule here at my office, um, and then um, at least one returning back to brick and mortar full time in October. Um, and, and we do have a lot of conversations that are being generated at this time about the length of time we've been working remotely and what that return to work looks like. And even can we return back to work at this time? So, so that those are all questions that we have that are, that are opening up and, and recent. Um, a question too, that's a follow-up to this. If you are returning to the, returning to the work or you have returned to the, to the workspace, and I see scholars had this experience already, um, is with the new variant and the increase in cases recently, at least in our region, um, have you experienced a situation where you've had to return back to remote work um, or had to put additional measures in place in your office for protection? All right. And I, I don't think that anyone has. We've got a lot of remote workers. Yes. All right. Um, so the current reality, at least from the headlines in, in our uh, country, are that uh, we have people in various states of planning with returning to work. And our IT uh, plans have to follow that shift. Uh, Chris Tuttle, when he was speaking earlier, mentioned that uh, you know, he really hopes that the remote and hybrid approach that we take towards event planning and training and even our daily work will continue after the pandemic. And, and generally, that's the consensus of other people in the United States as well. Uh, they're talking about um, agencies trying to bring employees back to work and planning what that arrangement looks like. How do we have some staff that continue to telework, either by the help of their families or for themselves, and, and then continue to have that physical space for their employees to be. Uh, active and, and how do they bridge that gap and communicate together? Uh, some public sector 
uh, organizations are offering vouchers and extra leave and bonus pay to entice their employees to return to work. And, and in a recent headline, and this was actually back in July, but I believe this uh, court case is still happening, uh, one state uh, in government organization in Connecticut is suing their government and their organization for requiring them to return to work without proper uh, arrangements in place for their safety. Um, and, and on top of all of this, we're dealing with the Delta variant and an increased uh, risk of cases. And those are presenting workplace concerns uh, where the Seattle workers are either walking out or protesting uh, and, and really wanting something to be done about the remote work arrangement and allowing them to continue that. Um, so, so all of these factors are at play. Um, and again, we have to learn how to be agile and shift around with technology to meet all of these needs. So there was a very good podcast recently um, about adopting a placeless mindset. And, and this is one of the cultural shifts that has occurred uh, with, with employees and staff uh, really worldwide is looking at how has, have my priorities and values changed because of the pandemic with regard to work? And what's important to me moving forward in the workplace and that maybe was not available to me before, but I expect moving forward. One of those things is location independence over physical presence, having that ability to choose where, when, and how you work. And a lot of the tools that we use now with technology, with Zoom and Slack and everything in between is allowing us to be able to do that and question why we really need to be in the office each day to do our work. Secondly, these employees are valuing autonomous work schedules and flexible schedules, having the ability to continue doing that, to be able to work in a 24 hour um, schedule instead of a eight or 10 hour work day. So if I have a project that I can work on from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., maybe I can do that. Or if I choose to work from eight to 11 the next day, then I should be able to do that and get my work done. And, and expect my employer to anticipate those types of roles. As long as I'm doing the job, that's what matters. Um, they're also going to expect asynchronous communication and collaboration. We're no longer a real-time environment. Uh, going into one meeting space and huddling together to brainstorm a strategy or talk about some type of project that's come on, onto your plate uh, it may be a thing of the past. It's really about sending that communication through electronic channels and expecting possibly not an immediate response, but a response in a time frame that both you and that other person can agree on. Additionally, all of us are expe expecting open and transparent communication, and we have to learn how to adopt that within our digital workspace. Uh, we're no longer in a mode where we can just go next door to another person's office and ask if things are okay. Um, so, so we need to continue to open those channels. And then finally, trusting your colleagues and employees to do their work, even though you can't see them on a daily basis, will be critical. So again, in this technology space, we have dedicated employees and colleagues that also care about our, pro our nonprofit mission in the community it serves. So, so this is just getting that broader communication and connection with the other people around us. So developing a placeless mindset, again, is very important, um, especially where technology is involved. Um, in your respective fields and your experiences, what are some of the norms or standard practices that your team had before the pandemic that have changed since the pandemic? And I'd like to get a special story from at least one or two of you where you use technology to bridge that gap. And it could be anything from implementing some new technology, um, hardware device that helped someone to be able to do their work, some type of product or software tool or application that enabled that cross-platform communication amongst all of your group members. Um, so, so does anyone have anything that they'd like to share um, and just you know, raise your hand either in the chat or on video, and I'll be happy to call you out.
Ivan, I see you. And I also see in your chat that you said that there's uh, was just a new state of emergency announced yesterday. So if you'd like to share uh, information with us, I'd love that. Oh, uh, in regards with the state of emergency, so uh, we we have provincial, just a reminder for our friends in the states, uh, for all of you, uh, we have provincial governments instead of uh, states. Uh, mm -hmm. Our provincial premier uh, basically declared the, uh, the end of the restrictions in June and July, at the beginning of July. And, uh, and I think uh, he just uh, conceded last night that it was too early. Uh, our ICUs are about the point of collapse uh, and, uh, and it's terrible. And I think that uh, that is just a horrendous call, a political call because there were political motivations. And I'm gonna leave it there because I am highly political, but I respect the fact that none of us are, not all of us are. And I just wanted to, uh, because nobody was volunteering a story, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer the simplest one. And this is around uh, Office, uh, Microsoft 365. Uh, I am currently between jobs, but I continue uh, a lot of volunteer job in the nonprofit sector in a large organization that uh, supports people with physical and developmental disabilities uh, and, and has a large physical footprint. They, we serve people, uh, both residential services uh, in, uh, in uh, inclusion in the workplace and also recreational services. We had to completely shut down our recreational services, but all the other services that you imagine are the lives of our clients, so have to continue. And both the board and all the 600 employees uh, of the organization, uh, again, this, this step quantum leap uh, force from one day to the other, I remember we used to have problems connecting on uh, on conference calls over over phone, and from one day to the other, the teams uh, because these residential support teams have to isolate themselves because these are people that have concomitant uh, health conditions. They cannot really see other members of the team because it's just not not safe. Uh, from one day to the other. Uh, uh, the IT staff step up and, and of course there were pains the first two weeks. Nobody knew what, what link to click uh, or how to create uh, efficiently uh, a meeting from a calendar invitation or from an email conversation. I think, um, I think this was well used time because uh, we all have to uh, plow through the whining that we we normally whine is like oh you know this never works and the people went like okay now we have no alternative this has to work because there is no other option and 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 again i think it's a good story unfortunately we are just starting to be able to establish how are we going to measure the impact on both our clients and our staff that because we are a diverse organization, we not all thrive looking at little cubby holes in our computers. Some of, some of us need physical contact, uh, both for an emotional support, and also it's just a social thing. Some of our clients and our staff require it. So we're just trying to grapple, how are we gonna measure this? How are we gonna address it? So thank you. Yes. You're welcome. Thank you. And, and you brought up a few great points on that, too, is one of the things that has been, a, a I would say, a positive aspect, uh, an outcome of this pandemic is to get the buy-in from your teams to introduce a, ne a new technology is more rapidly um, accepted, even though they still have challenges, like you said, not being able to click the link or open the tool. But they accept it and embrace it much more readily and they move forward. And, and that's an important aspect of this is to make sure that you have the right tools on board and that you're working through navigating those issues where you, you really can't work one-on-one -on -one and in person, uh, but, but you've got a team that's engaged and ready to move forward with that at the drop of a hat and take on that role. Um, so, so great, thank you for sharing that. Um, Addy, uh, Addy, I'm sorry, uh, we have a pilot, uh, we, we've had to pilot our project to set up our work on a digital platform to deliver our training and also offer our services at healthcare facilities 
because with COVID-19, we have not been able to offer our therapeutic services face-to-face. -face. Yes, absolutely. And navigating that, I, I know um, at least in the U.S., we have the, the HIPAA concerns, and I'm sure that's there's probably some regulations uh, that you, you probably had to face with doing uh, therapy um, online versus face-to-face -face as well um, and, and figuring out how to do that. Um, that's another challenge and having the right team involved in that and having the right tools is critical. All right, Judy, I see your hand raised. I forget that I'm muted. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I started Zoom sessions with my family. We are spread all over the country. We've had two family reunions over the years. And other than that, we never see each other. So monthly Zoom meetings have just opened up a whole new contact in our family, which I think is, is good. If we want to, we're going to continue them. Yes, absolutely. Yes. As, as, um, this has actually helped us, Zoom has helped us bridge the gap of geography uh, very easily, not only at work, but at home as well. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's opened up new ways to communicate that just didn't seem to be there before. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. All right. And feel free, I, I noticed Adi uh, wrote, um, having to uh, tr struggles finding the right tools being a challenge. Um, for, for sharing information um, and, and doing, uh, I'm, I'm sure doing virtual therapeutic services. If you know of any technologies and you're um, in this chat together, please share your uh, lessons learned with each other. Um, so, so the National League of Cities outlined some technology goals um, that, that they felt were important this, this year um, as they evaluated public sector and what they were adopting. And some of the uh, information that you've already shared uh, about your experiences have been very similar to what the rest of the public sector has experienced. Um, they, this year, they've invested in technology that enabled them to do remote work, keep their operations running, of course, with the hybrid approach or even having to go fully remote, um, being able to engage with their constituencies and then build operational efficiencies around their operation um, in, in general. Um, they're also realizing the increasing importance of having the remote capabilities and the digital workflows continue after the pandemic. And we talked about that a little bit as well. Um, a lot of these resources are really great tools, not only for now, but in the future um, to continue to embrace that as a culture for the work we do, um, enable better efficiency and productivity for your teams and help them to stay more engaged with one another. Uh, some of the top priorities that they identified through another uh, research uh, collaboration that they did with eRepublic found that they also are struggling with and will start looking towards technologies that allow them to have better citizen engagement remotely, um, to improve their process automa automation, and then, of course, modernize their infrastructure to support all of this new technology. So how did we adapt? Um, some of the things that, that all of us ex have experienced, and I know that we've adopted very quickly in the past two years, uh, has been one in the mobility space with cloud-based services and mobile technology devices, making sure that every person on our network has mobile technology in hand to be able to work, whether they're in the building or offsite. Um, automation tools such as client web portals, any AI or bots that can be incorporated into your chat features or, or your social media, um, touchless check-in, intelligent security cameras like Verkata, which is what we were using here, um, automated entry to our, our building, and then any other outsourced services that maybe we didn't have the technical expertise to in, implement in our office. Um, collaboration and communication were a big deal for many of us 
um, and, and globally, uh, file sharing tools, digital document processing, uh, communication being the, bi the biggest thing uh, when we're working remote is video conferencing like Zoom and Microsoft Teams, as well as chat features, uh, Slack, Discord. Uh, please feel free to put in the chat any other um, chat tools that you use on a daily basis. Um, we also transition from a traditional phone system over to voice over IP. So anywhere at any time, our staff can receive phone calls from the building. Um, and then provided some remote workers with hotspots and cell phones. And finally, we had security and uh, Jeffrey Brown just joined us and I don't wanna dig too deeply into the security that we introduced uh, because he's going to be doing a full presentation on EDR uh, next month and I'm excited to have him. Uh, but, but as far as security within our uh, building, we did int uh, introduce additional security tools for remote access, uh, doing monitoring of remote systems, and then transition from a corporate antivirus tool over to endpoint detection and response, which is a, a more robust security tool. So, so now I wanna know what's been a game changer for you in any of these areas. Um, and you don't have to report those out um, by, um, audio, but if you'd like to put them in the chat, share those with others. Um, but some of the tools that you can think of in any of these categories that either you introduced to your organization or your group or found useful during this time that helped you to continue to do your work and serve your mission. Okay, Chris reports um, automation using scheduling tools like Calendly. Yes, Calendly is amazing um, to, to be able to uh, manage your time and send out to someone that you need to meet with or work with the time slots that you have available to meet with them and, and let them choose. I, I, I love that tool. Yes, absolutely, Chris. Another tool that I use that's similar to that um, for group meetings, um, because we're still having those group meetings through Zoom, um, is a, a tool called um, Doodle. Uh, and that, that one also absolutely helps. All right, well, think about that. And, and as, you're, um, as I'm going through the presentation, if you can think of any other tools, please share them in chat. And we're going to do one other thing here. I'm going to open Mentimeter. And, and this is another tool that I found very useful. Um, it does word clouds, but um, in this case, we're going to use a little word bubble. Uh, let's see if I can show on my screen. No. Okay. Um, if you have the availability to do so, please go to www dot menti.com and enter the code above on my screen it's 97084965 and if you'll put in that screen some of the things that have been a game changer for you and what we'll do is is collect those as we're talking and then we'll come back to this um, in just a little while and see what people have shared All right, so putting all of that together, we talked about, and thank you, Chris, for sharing that. Um, putting that all together, um, one of the things, and, and this is what we, we've looked at so far in this presentation, is identifying the current technology and resources that have become necessary, critical, um, essential for us to be able to do our work during the pandemic. Um, and, and as, as several of you have mentioned, I wanna keep those around after this is over. And there's a good case for that. Um, we could have another pandemic. Um, no matter where you are in the world, there are weather events that can cause your operations to shut down. Uh, here in the Southeast uh, United States, our problem is hurricanes and ice storms in the winter. Um, for some of you, you may have typhoons, earthquakes, 
other natural disasters that could shut you down as well. And what we've learned through the pandemic is that if, as long as our teams have the resources and the technology and the capability to get on the internet to do their work, they can work just from about anywhere. And what we have in common is sharing that goal to serve our community. Um, so we're at a good position in, in our environment where uh, people can continue to work where before this happened, they were shut down. Uh, they were not able to do anything. Um, so we need to think about that as we start talking with our leaders about continuing to use these technology tools moving forward after the pandemic. Um, after that, we need to analyze those resources to make sure that they're still beneficial, that they're the right set of tools that we need to have in our back pocket. And, and then if there are any other tools that we need to plan for that we don't currently have. Next, we want to define the resources that we will continue to use and establish what needs to expand upon those as well. Are there certain tools that might need upgrades or enhancements? And then finally, you're going to put, a, put that all together in a plan and present that to your leadership for buy-in. So I'm going to share that plan with everyone in the chat now. And this is what I call the I adapt plan. And I'm sending this to you so you'll have something in hand to share with your groups and to, to work around that planning process. Okay. Okay. All right, and let's see, I probably did not share my previous screen where I was talking about those different buckets, but um, the eyes for identify, analyze, define, plan, and, and the technology, of course, is being the most important for our teams, um, I adapt. So opening that plan, open that up here and just go into a little bit more detail on that. If you can see my screen, I'm going to make it a little bit larger so we can all see it. All right, so, so digging down a little bit deeper in that, and again, you have the resource um, in chat as well. Um, one, you want to identify that technology. Uh, that starts by making a list and categorizing what resources you have available. Uh, brainstorming what tools they are, uh, whether it be Zoom or Slack or Discord or Calendly or your phone system or your mobile devices, making sure you have a full inventory of all of that technology. Um, determine early on who the stakeholders or representatives that need to be involved in this process are. You're going to need them not only for guidance, advice, support, for planning, but also for buy-in moving forward when you need to make those financial decisions about what technology is needed. Next, you wanna analyze those resources and determine what is most beneficial moving forward. Uh, that starts by a cost-benefit analysis. Um, what was most beneficial and can we afford to continue it? Um, are they sustainable in the long-term? Um, is it possible? And, and we'll use Zoom as an example. Um, Zoom gave everyone um, resources at no cost and limited cost at the beginning of the pandemic. And now as we are approaching coming out of that in some ways, um, those free resources are, are no longer free. Um, and, and having to pay for some of those premium services and, and making that decision of not only do we continue to use this, but how many of these can we purchase? And who do we need to purchase these for? Um, can they be used after the pandemic and how? And, and that question is gonna be left up to each one of your teams, but I would say that for the most part, that's gonna be yes, if you're considering all of the other situations that could occur in your work environment that would require you to work remotely. Um, do they benefit all users or just a few? Uh, there's several technology tools 
um, that I can recall that, that we purchased as an organization that were just for a few people to get their job done, um, but not were not necessarily something that we would need organization-wide. And, and at that point, we need to determine whether that's something that we need to continue to use. Um, what did we implement that is not being used effectively? Are there tools that you purchased early on that maybe one of your department directors or your leaders said, we have to have this, um, but the research is showing that there aren't that many users that are using that tool. Um, one of the ones that I can cite most recently for my organization um, is we purchased an add-on to our phone system for WebEx video conferencing. And it was not as user-friendly and our staff really enjoyed Zoom like uh, the rest of our team here today does. Um, and, and so we don't use that tool. And we need to go back to the vin vendor and say, uh, we don't need this resource anymore. Uh, Jeffrey's reporting DocuSign, has that been a, a, a good product for you, Jeffrey? Um, it's, a, it's a product uh, that you use to send out documents that need to be signed. The problem is everybody wants a DocuSign account, but only the people who are sending the document need an account. Absolutely. So defining yes. that set of people and making sure that they understand uh, really uh, uh, was a challenge for us. Absolutely. That is a perfect example. And I can relate to that. Jeffrey, I'm having the same problem in my office. Uh, everyone wants DocuSign. Um, and, and that's where, again, bringing this plan in and saying, okay, we've got to get these leaders to the table and talk about the reality of the fact that only the people that need to sign need this DocuSign platform and all of these other users can just go online and, and they don't need that full tool and we, and we don't need to invest the money in that. Um, another one that comes to mind is Adobe Acrobat Pro. Um, I have a huge list of people waiting to have that installed on their systems and to purchase the full version. Um, and, and you don't need that unless you're doing some focus work on uh, merging PDF files or editing or creating forms. And a lot of our teams only need to convert their Word document to a PDF file. Um, so, so those conversations need to happen early on. Uh, so you're not wasting your money, uh, but if you already have spent the money to determine uh, what, which users you should just roll off and not renew moving forward. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but again, what else do we need to do for the future? That's, that's part of that planning. Um, next, you wanna define the resources that you're gonna to continue to use and need to expand. Uh, looking at that DocuSign and saying, okay, these are the people that we're going to invest in the DocuSign platform. What do we need, need to do to renew their contracts? Um, or renew their um, subscriptions to that tool. Uh, Adobe Pro, uh, how many licenses do we need? Do we need to invest in Adobe Teams so we can manage all those licenses we purchased? Um, do we need to upgrade some of the software tools that we bought last year? Um, are they at the point where there's a new version that needs to be brought down? Um, so all of those things you wanna consider. Um, with all of the new resources, of course, you're going to develop a project plan for that and, and evaluate the risks and benefits again, but also determine the offsets of those costs. Um, and, and again, I'm not going to jump on Jeffrey Brown's presentation next month, but uh, one of the things that I would um, give as an example for offsets is we're currently on a corporate antivirus software and we're being driven to EDR, that endpoint detection response platform. Um, well, once we move there, we don't need the corporate antivirus anymore because that's rolled into the new product. So, so we're offsetting those costs and we're talking about that with our leaders to let them know, hey, this isn't gonna be a $5,000 uh, transition. This is more like a $2,000 transition because you've already invested the first 3,000 in the other product. Um, so, so having those conversations helps to build the buy-in and get approval for some of the technology that you're working on. Um, also determining your project implementation needs, looking at the timeline and being realistic about that. Um, you may have leaders that say, I want this technology platform yesterday. And you have to be able to give them a, a deadline of, oh, I may be able to get this implemented in 60 days or before the end of the fiscal year to be able to, to, to establish those realistic boundaries. 
and then determining the impact. Uh, how will this new technology product that we've introduced for remote work or hybrid work uh, impact not only the teams that are already using it, but the ones that we're going to introduce it to? And then finally, with all of that, you're putting that together again in some cohesive format where you can share your ideas and your challenges and your opportunities with your teams as well as your organization. Uh, I don't know if many of you have a board that you have to respond to when you make financial decisions, but everything that I do has to go to the board. Um, and having that in some type of cohesive and understandable format is very important. Uh, so pre preparing that goals-based technology plan that outlines your need, your purpose, your objectives, and your roadmap is essential. Um, some of the tips that I can give you in that is defining your need and purpose and being very descriptive, but allowing for some flexibility. Again, not making those hard line decisions of I'm going to have this rolled out next week when you really have so many other factors that could become constraints or roadblocks that get in your way. Um, prioritizing and setting your objectives with that identified roadmap and making sure that it makes sense, that it's in a logical path, um, and using smart methodology to outline those goals. That by such and such date, again, making that realistic, I will achieve this goal with a measurable outcome. And then finally, ensuring that your plan, your project roadmap, takes all those possible constraints that we talked about into consideration, including the approval process. Do you have a, a finance department that you have to deal with? Is there someone that has to approve your purchases other than you? Um, the purchasing process is in itself, dealing with vendors and uh, getting the agreements in place, um, dealing with staffing and support to implement those things and how that impact uh, will be felt by your end users. Are they gonna need training? Are they gonna need additional support? Um, any buy-in or adoption challenges, again, looking at that presentation to board or getting someone else involved in that for planning and, and approval. Um, and then finally, determining any other projects or requirements that may, that may impact this decision. So does anyone have any questions about this framework or using iAdapt or making technology decisions moving forward um, after the pandemic? All right, I hear no questions, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. I've got one of my favorite uh, actors of all time, Rowan Atkinson, on the screen for Mr. Bean. Um, he's, he's just got that good question face, but um, are there any general questions or anything that you would like to discuss? I'd like to open the table up to everyone here um, to talk about anything that they're working on, either um, as a technology pro project um, moving out of the pandemic or uh, any challenges that they need any advice or support from our team on. Yes, Ivan. Uh, thank you. So could, could you, um, within the, uh, within the uh, framework of your plan, um, could, could you speak, uh, could you speak about how, um, Nonprofit organizations make sure that they um, that they take advantage, like in this case, take advantage of all the uh, low cost or rebated opportunities that are out there. Um, you know, you you mentioned the um, the proverbial uh, Adobe Acrobat and uh, and at at six hundred or eight hundred Canadian a piece we could afford about zero in our organization, but at, uh, at $15 a piece, we, can pro we have been able to afford more uh, when we use TechSoup. So uh, my, my concern is that, um, my concern is that uh, as, as there is this, uh, this push of users, individual users bringing technologies that they might be familiar at, in their home, 
or with their families that are perhaps free to use for individuals, then when you try to do it, use it in the enterprise, they are extremely expensive. So how do we, how do we make sure us as administrators that we are using, uh, if not through TechSoup that, uh, I don't know, we, we know the, uh, the representative for our area and we, uh, we take them for lunch and we convince them that a donation is the right thing to do. Um, I, I, have, I have only experience with TechSoup and with some Microsoft products that are not included in the TechSoup offers because I know the people in the area, but, but there are certain things like you mentioned DocuSign that I have zero success uh, getting them to, uh, to uh, give us uh, low cost copies. Thank you. Yes, yes, that's a great question. And I would say it is a dilemma and it, it needs further research. Um, nonprofit, uh, the public sector, we don't we don't cry loud enough. We don't ask enough. And, and that's I think that's one of the challenges that that we face is um, finding those free and low cost resources. Uh, like you said, TechSoup is a wonderful platform. That's what we're all here for today. We, we're all um, champions of the TechSoup cause because they do great work in uh, giving low cost and, and even some free resources. Um, some of the other things that come to mind is Microsoft for nonprofits. Uh, we have not entered that space fully but there is uh, at least their, their basic level of services at no cost um, for, for technology uh, support for um, Outlook email, as well as uh, the Microsoft Teams platform. So that's one resource that, that I know of. Uh, Google Workspace also has a nonprofit uh, platform as well. Um, as far as the Adobe products and DocuSign products, that is definitely a challenge. Um, and I'm not sure where that will go in the future. Um, we do have Adobe Sign as well as DocuSign uh, that are the most reputable, most well-known, but like Ivan said, they're also very expensive. Um, so if anyone has any um, guidance or any experience with any other product that's worked well for them, please put it in chat. Um, but that, there's more to come on that. I think that um, that's one thing that as a community, as a tech, tech connect tech soup community, uh, we need to engage on and start talking about. And Ivan, I'd love to talk with you offline about that as well, uh, how we could share that those resources and, and talk about um, what's available. Yes. All right. Um, Jeffrey saying Dropbox also has a signature feature and I, there is a free um, level of Dropbox as well, isn't there Jeffrey? Um, are you able to unmute? Could you tell us a little bit about that if you know anything about it? Yeah, um, like I said, we've been going back and forth with this uh, DocuSign thing uh, for a while, um, primarily because um, they're just so expensive and they're just unwilling to, to discount anything for uh, for nonprofits. Um, so we, uh, we took a look at that. We took a look at the Adobe sign uh, which is actually the most economical uh, of them. Uh, and then uh, Dropbox, because we do have a few Dropbox accounts. The Dropbox one, though, is an add-on to their business product. So you would be buying the business and then buying an add-on just to get the signature feature. Um, and we just weren't able to roll that out you know, widely, uh, as everyone thinks they, they need to send documents to sign when it's just not true. Um, so everyone would want a Dropbox account. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just, there, there's no real, like I said, nonprofit friendly way to do signatures that I have found and I've looked everywhere. Absolutely. Hello, sign. Oh, Chris Settle. Hello, sign gives you three documents per month on their free account. So that might be something if you're uh, doing a few documents, at least there's some limited resources. Um, and I know DocuSign does a, a trial as well. So um, playing around with some of those does help. Um, Ivan, yes, you have your hand raised. Rebecca, is there an opportunity? Um, is there an opportunity for TechSoup? 
as a as an overall industry organization to do some uh, advocacy. That's ho- that's what we call lobbying for nonprofits in in Canada. We call it advocacy. Is there an opportunity for the organization to to go and represent the voice of the industry to organizations like DocuSign and and there are several pro- other project management tools that. Uh, we've been trying to implement because, again, individual licenses are free, but as soon as you try to use in, in a project, even with five people in a small nonprofit, it becomes very expensive. And I'm surprised that those startups have not have not think about nonprofits. Thank you. Yes, yes, that is a great question. And while I don't know the answer to that, our um, colleague with Tetsu. Eli Vandergeesen is an excellent resource to ask that question to, uh, and I will I will ask him because that is a great, great opportunity and a great question. So thank you. Yes, I will send that out to him. Ivan. Thank you. All right. Um, Chris mentioned also curious about folks who are, are, that are deploying systems remotely, um, particularly Macs and managing those. Um, that's a good question, Chris. I don't live in the Mac uh, space, but I know a few people who do, um, and they're mentioning. I don't know how they're how they're getting it cross platform. Um, but they're mentioning using VMware and Mirador, M R M I R A D O R E, are two platforms that I know a few people are using for mobile device management. Um, does anyone here in this group have anything to share as far as? Um, any platform that they're aware of for mobile device management um, of, of remote systems, particularly Macs? Uh, there's Jamf, which is the big one. Uh, and um, uh, we use Kaseya, but uh, Kaseya is really more geared toward Windows machines. But there is some limited things that we can do uh, on Mac. And then there's a new one out, uh, Ninja, something or other. I'm just looking it up. Uh, that also does uh, heavy Mac. Um, uh, remote management. Uh, I'll get back. I'll put it in chat once I find it. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. All right. Does anyone have any other questions or anything that they would like to discuss? All right. Oh, thank you, uh, Jeffrey. Just um, shared the the link to the Ninja Endpoint Management. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we are finished with our hour today, and I hope you got at least one resource today from this presentation that will help you in your work in the future. Um, Next month, we have Jeffrey Brown, who is with us today, um, and will be presenting uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, Jeffrey, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and and just say a few things to give us a, a sneak peek of what's to come in October? Sure. So um, my name is Jeffrey Brown. I'm the Global Help Desk Manager for IntraHealth International, uh, which is a global um, uh, NGO uh, that does uh, work with uh, healthcare workers in developing nations. Um, And uh, I've been in the IT industry for about 25 years and about 15 with IntraHealth. Um, And Really, you know, I, I started, you know, grassroots just in uh, helping people um, throughout their issues. My actual education is in aerospace engineering, um, but, um, you know, I found myself in the computer space and uh, making money, so kind of stayed here with it. Um, really, my main focus is, has always been on end user support. Um, you know, making sure that backups and uh, getting rid of malware and um, having the best antivirus available um, 
really have always been my focus and central management of those type of resources so that, um, you know, you can do some of these things remotely and easily and get to, um, you know, those resources. So really, we've got such a mixed bag of people here in this group. Uh, so I'm going to touch some on the various levels of these groups that we have in the uh, in the group, those that are just purely um, community driven without real um, infrastructure behind them. Uh, and then we're going to talk some about the small organizations where they do have some uh, infrastructure involved, getting your email all from uh, you know, a central uh, domain type thing, uh, and then more the enterprise um, where Rebecca and I uh, sit um, for what to think about along those lines. So it uh, should be um, fairly interesting. If you have anything specific, uh, I, I'd love to hear about what you want to hear about, and uh, I can incorporate it in the uh, presentation. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I, I'm excited to attend. Um, my um, team is transitioning from antivirus. Oh, Chris, thank you so much. I, I'm sad to see you go. I look forward to seeing you next month. Um, but um, I, our team is transitioning from corporate antivirus over to EDR in the next few months. And I, what I'd like to hear in your presentation is, is some guidance on how to navigate that without shutting everything and everyone out of the tools that they're used to using, uh, but but with security in mind as well. But I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. No problem. Looking forward to giving it. Wonderful. Um, so we are past an hour. And uh, thank you, Jeffrey. I, I wanted to give him an opportunity to announce himself and talk about our event for next month. Uh, next month, we have uh, Jeffrey's presentation, Navigating the IT Security Landscape in a Hybrid Environment. That's on October 28th, which is a, just a, a different week than what we're used to having our, our meetings on. Usually, we do the third Thursday of the month. Um, next month will be the fourth. Um, so please uh, sign in, join. It will be on Zoom again. Uh, to reach this page, go to events.techsoup.org and look for the North Carolina uh, NC Tech for Good chapter of Tech Connect. Thank you so much, and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon or evening. <laughs>